G'day, welcome back to Project Brewpig, the story of a sunken fishing trawler converting to global expedition and research boat. This week we got some maintenance done on our welder. We installed a heavy duty earth cable for it, we did some serious machining on some big hinges for our stabiliser wings, and we did a bit of a parts forage to gather as much stuff as we can so that we can keep working for the next couple of months. Yesterday we were doing the wings, welding them up, and um, I had to video Jess doing some welding and she said, just be careful, I don't want you to get archive. And I said, honey, honey, I got this. I'm an experienced welder, I know how to look after my eyes. I've been doing it for years. So that was obviously the first precaution I take was saying that. The second precaution I took was saying, darling, you can also look at it for a little bit of time and it doesn't cause archive. It just, you know, goes, makes you go a little bit blind for a sec and then it's all good, no worries. So anyway, pressed on, did the recording and so on and woke up this morning with this. See that red in my eye there? Yeah, that was awesome. Basically, I've got a little slit across. I was obviously squinting like this when I looked at it. A little slit that's burnt. It feels like I've got gravel in my eyes and they're just constantly watering. So that's gonna be fun for the next three days. So that happened again. I think we're gonna have to deal with this. It's starting to become a frequent fryer issue. So this is my solution, I just stripped it back. I don't have time to fix it properly at the moment, so we're just gonna clamp it directly to the steel using the clip. But uh, yeah, I think it's definitely time for an upgrade um, in the conductor, because it just keeps annihilating itself and jumping off the, um, the clip. So time for a cable upgrade. This is the original earth cable on the welder, and I can't get a single cable that's a big enough conductor. Um, it's a long story, but we can't access the shop at the second. So what my plan is, I went over the road to the chandlery and what I can do is get a second cable and basically duplicate the first. So we're going to run two cables side by side like this. So it'll go from uh, a terminal end um, down on the uh, alligator clip here, it'll go into that there. The two cables will run down and all the way to the welder and then I'll go through into this end here which um, plugs into the welder. My plan is to cut a terminal and um, splice both ends into it and feed it in and clamp it all down. Um, just like what they did the original, but in this case with a terminal. You can see they've put like a copper sheath over top of the original cable, um, folded the cable around, put it over top and then crimped down on it. And that dimple there fits with this screw here, so into the original um, fitting as it goes around. And there's quite a bit of corrosion, so we have to basically protect that. Now the point of this upgrade is getting more earth cable, so this here isn't big enough, so we need to basically find a bigger conductor than this one here. The options that we have is getting a second conductor like this. It's slightly smaller and it's tinned, but it means we can essentially get more amps through this cable here overall. We do have to do some protection of this end um, so that we can make sure we don't get corrosion down this cable. So this cable had bad corrosion. You can see this fluffy stuff here. The only way to solve it is to literally cut it off. Um, there's no way of getting around that. And if you flick these strands, you'll just see how much junk is sitting in them um, and all of that causes resistance and bad connections. So this is non-tinned copper, so this is just straight copper conductor and corrosion can travel so it'll go right up the cable, it could go way back here for argument's sake and you just have to keep cutting it back until you get you know, to wherever that corrosion stops so you're working with fresh copper. Tinned cable on the other hand is quite different so let me show you some tin cable. So this is a piece of tin cable, and you can see the difference between tin cable and just regular copper cable. Copper has no corrosion protection on it, um, and it opens itself up to all of this corrosion junk that's on it. Tin copper has uh, solder on every strand, so it's much, much more robust when it comes to corrosion in a marine environment. It's sometimes harder to get tin cable in a, um, you know, in large cables and things like that, and you can do protections on non non-tinned cable however it's pretty easy for that barrier to break down so if you can if you've got the option to purchase tinned always go with uh, tinned cable so we strip them both back and they just fit inside this terminal which is what we want the plan is to get them in like this we'll go downstairs and we'll crimp them and then we'll heat shrink from one end to the other but before we do that i want to fill the inside up with a liquid electrical tape so that we can make sure that we're not going to get corrosion so I crimped them downstairs and cut the end off and uh, not even remotely going to fit so we have to come up with a new plan. What I'm thinking is recycle the old uh, piece of copper that they had wrapped around the original cable. I'm pretty sure I can do a better job than what they've done. This is obviously just a quick production thing they've done. Um, they've just folded it over, 
like that and then sort of crimped it you know together with this wrap around we're going to do a version of that but we're going to be using the two cables um, to yeah jam inside the original fitting so we fitted the copper thing across the top and crushed it down with this cap screw liquid electrical tape it's blimmin amazing so in its liquid state you can fill it up from behind the terminal it'll run down the cables and take up any air gaps and then you end up with a resin encapsulated terminal like this so we're going to put a bit of um, resin infused heat shrink over these i don't think i'll even need this because i've got so much corrosion protection going on with that liquid electrical tape um, but we'll put this on anyway it's pretty amazing stuff once you've um, got it really shrunk right down the resin sort of encapsulates everything don't know if it's actually going to work in the wind here I'll stuff it we'll go inside and do it keep talking good keep talking sweet keep sugar raw baby i got you good i got you sweet got you on hold my baby Alright, maintenance over, let's go and do some engineering. So the next part of our stabilizers is figuring out how we're going to do the hinges. So this is where the arm joins onto the wing. So these big pieces of steel that I'm drilling here, there's four pieces welded together so I get the hole in the right spot. These are going to become the cheeks that get welded into the wing that the pin on the arm connects to. So this is a 10mm drill that I'm trying to use. I'm trying to get depth, um, the little uh, 3.2mm drill that I was using as my centre drill just isn't long enough to go all the way through the 80mm of steel. So it's a 10 mil drill. It's also a cobalt drill, so I need to go pretty careful with this because it's even though it's just mild steel, if I break this off, we're never getting anything else through this hole um, because cobalt is, is pretty hard and it's almost impossible to drill something out that's broken off like that. There we go. I think that's through. Lovely. Should see wood. Yep, awesome. Seeing wood. Yeah, it's a bit fast. I think I definitely need to slow that down. So I've slowed the drill press right down. Um, this is as slow as I can get this drill to spin, which is quite good. I don't know what the RPM is, but I'm pretty happy with that speed. You've got to be really careful not to go too fast because you'll burn up your tips. If you're going too fast, it's based on meters per second. You have to stay below a certain number. Above it, you'll start getting too many problems. Below it, you'll just go slow, so there's no issue. If you still use Imperial, it's a pretty simple calculation. You just take one fathom divided by a quarter rotation of the moon on a leap year, and then divide that number by 12 because you guys love working in fractions. Let's see how this thing actually does. Put a bit of lube in there. Well, okay, so there's a lot of chatter going on. If you look at the top of the drill where the drill is reduced shank, you can see it's bouncing all over. So the drill's being pushed from side to side by the hole. The drill press just doesn't have enough grunt to hold it. So we have to basically solve that. Yes, we could drill through, but we're going to end up with a hole bigger than 32 mil if we keep going. The deeper I go, the better it seems to be working, and it looks like it is starting to work now. So I need to do some modifications to this drill. I want to get rid of the chatter, that's my goal. And to do that I need to get the drill bit closer to the drill press. So I need to remove this bit of the shank here. So we'll do a bit of measuring up and we'll figure out how much we can cut off it. I also don't want to ruin the alignment that I've got. So I don't want to take the drill bit out of the drill press and, and or move the work at all. So what I'm going to do is in this part here, I don't want it to drop down. So I'm going to use a vertical lathe and a cutoff disc, spin it up and go and cut it.
Right, hopefully that's made a bit of a difference. We need to make sure we've just got less chatter happening on the drill bit. Can't see what I'm doing, we'll give it a bit of an empty. When you're drilling right down close to the end of the drill travel like this you have to be really careful if you get the swarf jamming up on the side of the drill it can stop it from rotating and then you snap the drill off and drills are notoriously difficult to um, remove and drill out so you just need to be really careful and keep the threads on the drill bit really clean i've taken one of the plates off because i need to be able to drill all the way through and i don't want to go from the other side so um, i've lifted the workbench up and yeah should be able to get all the way through in one go with this now um, I should hopefully be able to start to see some wood chips coming out and that way we know we're getting pretty close. So you can sort of feel the drills coming towards the end of the travel. We should I think we've got wood. Yep, lovely, there we go. This while Jess welds away. I'm cutting out some slots for where these new cheeks are gonna go. So these are the cheeks that we drilled. Um, they're 100 mil wide, 20 mil thick, and they basically sit snug up against that structural member there like that. So I've got to cut that essentially 20 by 100 mil slot, do that out of that one there, and then I've also got to mark it out of just on the inside down there as well, do that on both sides, but this is going to be my test wing to figure out how to do it. Have you done? Have you done? Five past great when you want to go. Yeah, that's yeah, better. That better? Oh. Yeah, much better. Yeah, yeah. So I basically cut out the square here as close as I can to the structural member. And this thing here has to sink through it like that. And it gets welded basically there. Um, so we'll weld up here, we'll V out along here and we'll weld down there and then straight down that side and then all the way around the bottom edge here. Um, what I'm also planning on doing is welding in some gussets down this way as well. So one across there, one down that way and one down this way. So we can spread the load as much as possible. We'll just see how we how we go. Um, but yeah, we'll just keep throwing steel in until I'm confident that it's good. I do need to clean this one up over here. I'll show you the weld and the reason why I'm cleaning it up. This one here, you can see the weld is um, sort of cut halfway through the weld. So I need to basically take a wee bit more of that out so we can get the cheek through. I also need to trim um, the edge that's on the bottom of the screen as well. So we've got to get in there now, clean up the surface on this side of the wing so that we can start the welding process. In case you're wondering what I'm doing. So we need this thing to be stupid, stupidly strong. And um, Essentially what I'm doing now is cutting in an uber bevel, so that's a super bevel with an umlaut in the middle. At 
as with most things on this build, if we're not sure that we've got something strong enough, we kind of have a standard operating procedure of throw more steel at it until it's too heavy to lift. That way it's generally pretty good. Righto, uber bevel finished. So if you look at it sideways, you can see there's quite a big sort of cut into that beam. And we're gonna do exactly the same on the end of this um, cheek that we're gonna weld in. And then we'll fill that whole thing back up with weld, just like what we did when we did these um, joins here. We beveled both sides off and, and then filled it back up. We're gonna do that on the bottom here. And then down the sides where we've got a, um, essentially a 45 created by the two pieces of steel, we'll fill that up with maybe five runs of weld do a pretty solid run on either side um, and then yeah just we'll see how we go I'll put a weld all the way around here but we'll see how we go in terms of what it looks like I might put a pad out here somewhere and then do a gusset just picked up a heap of steel so um, this is 75 mil three inches by six mil or quarter inch that stuff there is two meters long each and I've got uh, nine lengths of that they're gonna become our strengthening so if I come down the side of the boat here where that doubler sits on the hull um, it crosses over uh, what has it got it's got a bulkhead in the middle and it's got a, a rib um, 450 mil from either end from the center out we're going to basically add in um, one two three four extra ribs and then they're going to extend down past the chine and down the hull as well so that's going to be the internal strengthening those additional ribs that's basically the modification we're going to be doing to the hull to make the hull stiff enough to deal with ice um, we can probably go down to the ice as is we've had a few people that are experienced in that tell us that it'll be strong enough we don't really want to take the risk so we're going to beef the hull up by adding in an extra rib in between all of the originals so that uh, three inch by quarter inch steel that we've got that's going to be basically a duplicate of what's already on the boat i think i've been told I need to feed the aminal. Feed me! So we've got some challenges going on. Um, it's looking like lockdown is probably going to be in a few weeks time in Australia. Uh, so we're trying to figure out what parts are we going to need and what can't we get um, you know in that time frame anchors is actually something that we were going to order um, but that's going to come in from overseas we don't necessarily know if that's even possible anymore um, so we are moving towards building our own anchors so this morning's job i need to whip up into the wheelhouse and design up our anchor so that i know exactly how heavy it's going to be and i make sure that it's the right weight for brew peg so this is the anchor we need to create. So the little blue square is essentially a plate of steel that I know is sitting in town and I can just get this anchor shape out of that um, piece of steel. It's not, ideally it's not as big as I want because then the, the uh, blade would be one piece but I can weld winglets on without too much drama. It's going to end up with a 90 kg anchor which is about 20 kgs under what I wanted but it's definitely enough to get us going. So now that we've got our big uber bevels cut, I've ground up, you can sort of see around the edge where we're gonna do the welding. It's been ground up smooth, so we're good to go. There's no rust to have to power through. And I've also, when I plasmed, I blasted quite a big bevel on the underside, but I'm gonna dig that out more with the grinder. Um, I'll probably, probably even dig that out once I've got the plate in there, just so that I can fill it back up and, and bond it onto the plate. Um, but yeah, now what I wanna do, where are we? Here's my plate. So two of these need to align perfectly. So what I'm going to do now is get off my workbench that was tipped over earlier. I'm going to take this stainless uh, bar, cut it to length, and then I'm going to sit it between two cheeks that are going to fit through there. 
and then we can weld them in and that way they're going to be perfectly aligned because the bar will stay in the whole time we're welding. I have just remembered though, before I do that, I need to make these things look pretty. So I'm going to chuck them in the vise and grind them all up so that they're the same radius across the top. Before we can weld this in, we need to know how big we need to make a pin. Inside cheek to inside cheek is 175mm. We've got 20mm plates, so we've got 20, well, let's call that 40mm. So that's our plate. Uh, so what have we got there? That's, so we've got 215. Five, let's check that. Yep, that's good. 215. How much do we want to leave to keep this thing, if we went 250 which is our maximum, 215, what does that give us, 1, 3, 35 mil, alright, so let's go 250, pin equals 250 millimetres. Right, that's me done building for the night. Um, it's getting sort of late-ish. It's gonna be close to six o'clock, I'd say. Um, we have to do a parts run into town. Um, we are trying to scrounge up everything that we think we're gonna need over the next two to three months. It's a case of grabbing everything that we can, such as steel and um, parts, accessories, wire, grinding discs, all that sort of stuff, so that we can pretty much run for a couple of months without needing a top-up. One thing we did pick up today was this. So it's a piece two and a half meters long, uh, about half a meter wide, or five, 560 mil wide, something like that, but it's a slab um, of uh, 350 grade uh, steel, 20 mil thick, that is going to become an anchor. We were going to buy an anchor, well originally we were going to make one, and then we thought, no nah, we'll buy one, we got a quote, it was $6,000 for an anchor, and we're like, yeah, we're not paying that. So we thought, okay fine, we'll go and look elsewhere. We found some in China, I know everyone has a go at Chinese copies and whatever, but we've used them before and they're actually okay if you get the right ones and it's made out of the right steel. That was about 1800 bucks landed in Australia. So we thought, yeah, that's a much better price, but it's still pretty expensive. So uh, yeah, that's why we started to move towards building it ourselves, particularly because we can't necessarily get anything at the moment with freight. So this one so far, it's cost us about, what did it cost us? $80 to get the hoop bent. I'll show you that in two seconds. And the steel today was $350. So significantly better, probably be 50 bucks worth of wire and then maybe a weekend to build it. So for less than 500 bucks, we're gonna have an anchor. This is the hoop, so this is what goes at the back of the anchor, so between that white mark there and that white mark there, if I come back a bit, you can sort of see the shape of it, that is um, 765 millimeters OD, um, so it gives you an idea of how wide the anchors are, give you some context, there's a car tyre on the back of my ute, and there's the hoop, so it's bigger than a car tyre round, it's quite a large hoop. And that black roll over the back is uh, fuel proof rubber, so that's going to be used to seal up our fuel tanks um, so that we can start getting the diesel into the tanks without them leaking. Time for food, Pussycat. Pussycat. You got ice like summer sky. If you smart, could kill up, die.
And now it starts to rain, so let's enjoy it. I can't 